the ocean tides were kind enough to bury the fallen on its shores. However, the smoking ruins of Cloudfire greeted us with nothing but destruction and the stench of death. With no survivors, only the battlefield could tell me what happened here. Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to talk about Heroes of Might and Magic 3, the restoration of Erathia. It was developed by New World Computing Incorporated and published by the 3DO company in 1999, originally for PC, then also for Mac and Linux. It was nominated to us by long-term community member Verdito via Twitter. And I'm going to talk about it with I'm Carl, and I cannot believe that it was the 3DO company. I genuinely lost my ass off when this game booted up. I was just like, weren't they dead? <laughs> well, they oh, are no. now. Well, they're dead now, but uh, this this was their bread and butter for a little while. And hi, I'm the Great Clay. Yeah, yeah, like, I, I'm I was... I'm Yeah. Did, I thought, did you not... Even, all right, whatever. Uh, I thought you introduced yourself. Who's going to forget Tack? No, I just... I meant the intro, but... Uh, then again, so this is a strategy game, so you can you kind of see who's, who's going to be around for this. Yes. <laughs> da, 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 da. Oh, a turn-based strategy game. I wonder who the hosts are going to be. Wait, I kept yeah. opening the floor to the other hosts. Everyone else, I'm like, hey, we got a slot. Come on, Heroes of Might and Magic 3, everybody. Anyone, I'm... literally anyone, come on in. <laughs> Please do not leave me alone with Clade and Cax to talk about Heroes of Might and Magic. <laughs> yeah, the, the crickets were deafening. Yeah. Yeah, this game here is the, the sequel to Heroes of Might and Magic 2, The Succession Wars, as well as Might and Magic 6, The Mandate of Heaven. So the Might and Magic series, as in the one that's actually called Might and Magic, that came first. But at this point, it has been eclipsed by the spin-off series Heroes, also because there hasn't been a new Might and Magic game in, like mainline game in 15 years. Um, <clears throat> 10. 10, okay, well, good enough. No, 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 Might and Magic 10 came out, like, five years ago. Really? Yeah. What? That was only five years ago? That uh, looked like it came out 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's not wrong. Mm -hmm. So, just to confirm, with Might and Magic, because you called this one a spin-off, technically, um, the, uh, yes. those are, uh, what are they, like, dungeon -y sort of games? Like, wizardry sort of style things? Yeah, well, they, they are RPGs. first-person RPGs, but they're actually kind of open-world Probably yeah. some of the first. Yeah, the they're also mid nineties open world, so you can imagine what that world looks like. That's uh, gorgeous. Do I have to? <laughs> I well, there's the there's, there's no lighting and uh, everything looks kind of muddy. Oh, good. Uh, decent for that time, and I think <laughs> gameplay wise, some of them hold hold up. But I think Might and Magic was. I think it's fairly well known, but it was never like Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest well known. No, it's. Probably the least known of the big three, to be honest with you. Big three? Are you including Persona, maybe? Uh, no, no. What's I've, these other I, the, new video games, RPGs? Uh, the, the big three. Hyperdimension you know, Neptunia. Ultima, or, uh, Ultima. Ultima, Wizardry, and Might and Magic. I guess Wizardry uh, comes out in front because it's still getting games today, and Ultima yeah. is Ultima. So, uh, at, the, at least in Japan. Japan just took Wizardry. Yeah. And now it's Japan's. That's great. They yeah. can keep it. Thank you. Uh, now Japan also took Might and Magic and did a lot of console stuff with it, but it must have never caught on in the same way Wizardry did. Because yeah, they've got a special version of the first game, that the one just that they just called Might and Magic or Might and Magic Book One. That also has a number of modifications. It's um, a little bit more marginally more JRPG, but this series here, Heroes of Might and Magic Three, that's still kicking. It hadn't had a mainline release in a bit, but this game specifically here, Heroes of Might Magic 3, that one's still very popular. I would say it's the overall most successful in the Heroes series. And the both it both sells uh, fairly well for a game that's 20 years old and also has an active multiplayer community, especially in Eastern Europe. Which is kind of crazy. Because does got this, a ban list. this game takes like uh, firstly, yeah, yeah, it's incredibly unbalanced, and <laughs> I think it takes seven to ten years to get through a game, which probably is why it still has an active multiplayer community. They started. <laughs> I think they're still they're still playing the games from back then. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 
uh, you are correct. So it's turn based, and there's also neutral stacks. So there's there's a good chance that you can you can just wait for your opponent to fight some neutral creatures while you do nothing. But that's also why a lot of multiplayer games use auto combat. Yeah, at least against we, neutral stacks. Good for me because I like auto combat um, because I can't be bothered to do the actual combat, even if it makes some. Uh, it does make some questionable decisions. I've seen it do some. Yeah, it does. There, there's certain creatures where, like, if you control them as a human, you will be much more successful. And the same goes for magic. We should probably explain this game a little bit. Yeah. So it's a turn-based strategy game. I think what distinguishes it most from other games, like Age of Wonders, is that you have creature stacking. So you typically are heroes. They lead stacks, but they don't fight themselves, at least not in this game here, uh, only indirectly through the use of magic. And they don't appear as a creature on the field. So you do have creatures who fight for you and they stack. So you might see, let's say, a goblin on the field, but that could be 457 goblins kind of, they're just aligned perfectly. So you only see one. But I it's like so that perfectly you can, uh, aligned, it's actually 400. In the world map, you can eyeball it by right clicking them, right? And you kind of like, oh, there's a few. Uh, <sighs> there's a lot. Oh, God, there's an entire horde. We're dead. Yeah, I also... the worst is sounds. <laughs> oh, I haven't seen sounds in forever in this game. Sounds, that's an Animaniacs and a half. Ah, uh, sounds. But I, my my favorite part about how the stacks in this game, we're not throwing that number out randomly. Four, stacks of 400 is a real thing in this game. And it's the most might and magic -y number because that's like a tradition in those games. Like you ran into 37 goblins. <laughs> And yeah, just so hanging out. It's it's kind of I think it's a really reasonably clever way to do it. We uh we did talk uh somewhat recently about Conquest of Elysium. Oh, thank goodness I was able to remember that name. It's so generic. I'm impressed. Um, thank you. Uh, where it does the opposite. You know, it's just like oh, uh, there's 400 units. No problem. Here's 400 units on the screen. Uh, which was not really much of a possibility in 1999. At least not with the uh sort of streamlined efficiency that this one throws at you. Uh, there is, I think there is a pretty hard number on how many, uh, you know, stacks of units you can take into combat. It's not, um, it's not like an infinite number or anything. The, uh, no. the combat map is, is quite small. It, it's, uh, you know, it is, you, you play like a weird little, uh, basically like a little tactics kind of, uh, mini yes. game where you just move so units around a board. Yeah, it's the, no the main... simplistic bastard thing. Yeah. The, the main map is, square based but the combat map is hex based and every so there's different factions nine in total if you have the expansions and they all produce seven creatures and they have increasing levels and you don't gain levels just the tier of the creatures and they generally get stronger and stronger but they also have a slower creature growth so in your in your cities creatures can be kind of bred in creature dwellings and you get new ones every week and which is weird if you're you humans uh, yeah, kind of. Just kick it. some new archers. <laughs> it is. Well, they're just kind of, I guess they're trained. I think it does say you, you, you got like growth and trained, you know. They, yes. They yeah. with, with some creatures, it makes sense. Like the troglodytes, they look like they were, they're being like bred somewhere. But yeah, it, it's, it's a little bit strange for some creatures. You can have up to seven perfection and you also have seven creature slots. So if you want to mix your army, which may or may not be a good idea then you have to make some decisions. But you can have multiple heroes, even though most of the time it's advised to have one main hero. Uh, you can have a whole bunch of them for scouting or to form hero chains to get new troops to the front lines. Yeah, well, and as, you, that's as you said, one I just want to confirm, um, with the stacking, uh, due to it being the same as basically every other stacking type of game, uh, it is incredibly disadvantaged uh, to have a split stack for the most part. Um, oh, yes. So uh, that's occasionally, this game has the best math. <laughs> yeah. Occasionally, you it's it's wise if you fight weaker stacks on the map and you have, let's say, a ton of archers, then it's nice to split them up a little bit so you can just gun down the opposition. But for the most part, uh, you don't want to do that, especially once you unlock all your creature dwellings and you actually can include every creature. In certainly I've army. noticed with the, the AI has a tendency to run around with a couple of big stacks and if you uh, foolishly have several heroes with smaller stacks, they will just be like, take out that one, take out that one, take out that one. You're like, oh, okay, I see how this is. But you could yeah. quite readily have won if you had one stack against that stack. Yeah, generally, 
I found it most advantageous to have one really strong hero that doesn't go for every map, especially in the campaign, where occasionally they give you different faction towns and you can't convert those. So if you start, let's say, with a castle, that's the human faction, and a rampart, that's the like foresty naturey faction, then you can mix the army, but you might also just raise two different armies. And you might also find that certain heroes you have, they, have all, they all have skills and specialties and stats that they're just more suitable to lead other armies because every faction has a set of might and a set of magic heroes. Oh! With different specialties. Yep. It actually ah. makes, it makes total sense. So they, they're the heroes. They, they didn't, they didn't crowd all that in. That's actually it's quite mechanically well integrated. Yeah. And. Uh, that's actually one of the most fun parts, in my in my opinion, leveling up your heroes and see what kind of skills you get. Uh, maybe not if you get Eagle Eye or another completely useless skills. The skills are widely imbalanced. Some of them are game-breaking, like Diplomacy, and some of them are just completely useless, like Navigation if you're on a land map, or Eagle Eye is uh, infamously bad. They always cheat you with these damn swimming abilities. Swimming is never a good trait to take, ever. Just- Unless if you're playing Might and Magic, the RPG. Oh, okay. Then it is completely necessary. <laughs> you drown. But, yeah, but then they don't give it to you. <laughs> yeah, then you gotta... that's, that's that's how those RPGs worked. You could you could choose between like one of thirty seven skills in the beginning, but you, if you didn't pick these three skills, then you'd, either game would be even harder than it already is, or would just completely break. I'm glad you, you sort of mentioned that though, because this game actually does a considerably decent job of, uh, as you said. Um, the way it gives you abilities is it doesn't kind of give you a tech tree very often. It actually hides a lot of things uh, that it doesn't really want to tell you. Uh, yeah. So it's kind of like, look, do you want this or this? Just pick one. Come on, pick one. Doesn't matter. Just do it. Okay, we're moving on. Um, which is, I think, part of the longevity of Heroes of Might and Magic is, um, even though it does have a lot of, you know, the higher, you know, depth strategic stuff that you can learn if you keep playing it, entrance into the game is quite a low bar. If you can pick between, like, two options, you'll be like, okay, well, I'm still rolling. I'm still getting into the game. You'll you'll learn through playing it. Like, the skill curve... Uh, also, because, you know, the game has four difficulties, I think? Is it five? Five? Okay. Yeah, I think it's five. Because yeah. it's... You use it's the like different chess pieces. pieces. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you've got this... um. You know, it, it really does want you to sort of just get into the game and, and gradually learn upwards. So that's very nice if you're trying to, uh, you know, get into this kind of game. You should join this recording and talk about it. Check it. <laughs> <laughs> and it should also be noted that not every hero can learn every skill. Certain heroes have certain tendencies to learn some skills faster and might not be able to learn other skills at all. For example... The necromancers, they have a very high chance of learning the necromancy skill if they don't start with it. Ah. And they can also, for the magic heroes, they can learn the various magic schools. The mind heroes can too, but the chance is less likely. But they might be able to learn something like tactics or defense and stuff like that more frequently, which then affects your creatures as well. And playing around with these abilities is, in my opinion, one of the most fun parts, especially if you learn higher schools of magic. Those can be very powerful. I was and going to some say, of them are outright broken. Yeah, the uh, it did feel from the time I spent playing it that the might heroes, uh, due to the fact that they don't participate in combat, uh, they kind of did feel a little bit weaker on occasion. Um, because well, if you don't have the creatures uh, to sort of throw the the enemy out, the obviously the more direct magic, uh, you know, spells and the disruption spells and everything, it just kind of uh, helps your army better. So. Oh. The yep. reason I like my heroes, if I can, really quick text, is going back to that math I mentioned, um, you get a lot better stats on your might heroes, and because you yourself don't fight, your characters pick that up, or your, your creatures right. pick that up, and, like, they're the best ones to give, like, the stacks of, like, hundreds of guys to, because then it's like, oh, well, they all ha- I have a hundred, two, three hundred guys with attack of one. But my might hero all multiplies that by five. So they're wandering around the battle and they're doing like hundreds upon hundreds of points of damage every time they slap something. And it's amazing. That definitely is something that'll throw you off. I did say it was had a relatively easy, uh, you know, uh, god dang, I can't remember how to say like field of entry. I don't know why I'm getting this in my head, but you know, um, yeah, like the the barrier for entry, maybe that's the right one, uh, is, is reasonably low, but... Yeah, when it does stuff like that, like if you don't kind of key in that, uh, well, that hundred is actually 
going to be like 600 and that 100 is like only 100 and you're like whoa why did i just okay i just got my ass completely destroyed i don't know exactly what happened there um, yeah, that's, yeah that does happen although i would say that a pure might hero would be weaker than pure magic hero but that's not really what you have most of the time generally you choice, people as you said yeah but generally people will play uh, uh, a might hero with a bit of magic but it also depends on their specialty some of them are really really good there's one guy that gives everybody plus one movement. It doesn't sound that significant, but as you mentioned previously, the battlefield is small. You can actually cross it in one go. The certain okay. creatures, yeah, just run up and slap them. But uh, this is yeah, like I did want to say uh, on that note, like uh, obviously, if they don't have any spells, I don't think they can do anything in the combat. That like no, they they can't attack in in this game's most direct sequel, Heroes Five. That's mechanically closest. Uh, not well. The obvious sequels, Heroes Four. The the mind heroes will actually like drive by, like sword stab some creatures. So they fix that a little bit. Okay, because yeah, that's something that I did notice is uh, if you accidentally, because first you got to make sure you buy the spell book, otherwise they cannot learn spells, right? Indeed, yeah, that's something that oh. I always forget. At yeah. the beginning. I don't know, even like twenty years later. <laughs> hey, let's move out. Oh, forgot the spell book again. It does I feel think- a little bit arbitrary. Uh, like, yeah, especially because the price is fairly low. Yeah, even it, at the beginning of the match, that money maybe in like really competitive multiplayer matches, that money matters. But for the most part, especially in the campaigns, it just it does not matter. There's treasure chests everywhere. Instead, there's there's stuff everywhere. These maps they're not empty. There's barely any <laughs> tiles that are not covered by creatures or buildings or treasure chests or artifacts. So this world, imagine you just leave your house, Im- you immediately fall over a crown. I love that into, so like, much. And then you run into like 30 skeletons that are just guarding a pair of boots. And then you just, yeah, you, you just run away from those. You run into like a witch hut and you just, you, you don't get anywhere. You just stumble into stuff. It's the stuff just, everywhere. You step outside and you're like, Oh, I found a pile of gems again. Oh, put it in my big old chest of gems. Off we go. It's like, why are these valuable? There's everywhere. People just There's just too many of them. Oh. Nobody can collect them. And my favorite oh, is if you, if you try to pick up an artifact and it turns out it's guarded by creatures and then it's guarded by like 600 peasants. So at what point did these 600 peasants gather and decide to guard like the shield <laughs> of the damned? Like, what, what, yes. What's the backstory here? What happened? <laughs> Actually, that oh, one favorite. sounds vaguely more explainable, right? You could easily be like, uh, they became possessed by the damned uh, thing uh, and now they're just yeah. Yeah. My favorite is when you get like the centaurs guarding a quarry or some bullshit. <laughs> don't touch our stone. You can't mine it, but don't touch it. Yeah. Well, I've got six hundred demons guarding this gem mine. I'm like, well, okay, it's all yours then. Mm-hmm. I I do find um find that kind of interesting. It's got the uh, when you click on things, it's got the little stories attached to them. Usually, like uh, the usually where's where a little bit of the game's levity comes from. I think like it might. Describe a vaguely humorous uh, situation or something like you know, ah, like, oh, this uh, you know, it's some wizard looks like a wizard. It's a tree that looks like a wizard. Uh, oh wait, I think it actually is a wizard. We're just gonna take his ring and leave. <laughs> yeah, my favorite part is when you get a quest and someone says like, you meet this old man, this hunt, and he demands that you give him the like boots of flying, and that's just nothing you can do. You have an army of like eight hundred demons with you. But no, you can't. The old man says, "You give me the boots," and then he just closes the door. And that—that's where you're at. He's a really doesn't matter. Really you might tough be backed negotiator. Up. Yeah, you have. You're literally flanked by Satan. But no, <laughs> that sounds suspiciously accurate to um, anyone who holds out on a property. You know, they're like, "I need to build a freeway through your house," and they're like, "No, that's it." You know, you're, you're like, "All right, I guess we build a freeway around their house then, because we're dickheads." <laughs> um, I like. The, the map itself is uh, pretty cool. I like that. This is obviously not the first one that did it. I think the previous two games basically did the same approximate deal. Is that right? Yeah, the first... Yeah. Uh, there's some differences, but for the most part, this is Heroes 1 and 2, but more. Mm. I just, Plus Kings of Bounty, or King's Bounty. That is very true. I did find it like, really strange, though. I kept trying to scroll the map with the cursor keys, because a lot of strategy games do that. But in this one, it makes your character run around the map. Which is weird oh, yeah. and strange, <laughs> and I don't like it at all. No, nobody ever uses that. It's really gross, and I hate it. 
this is like the first game where mouse scrolling is like really good, even to this day. So I, I usually click on the mini map because I can't be bothered to wait for the map to scroll. Um, that's that's me. It's, yeah, it's, I'm that's patient. Fair. Alter- uh, alternatively, you just blow this up to 1440p resolution and have just half the map the on your screen. <laughs> Yeah, there. That much I guess we could talk about that if you like. There is many versions of this game, and we might as well yep. run over them so, real brief. Yeah. Do it quick, as, man. As, okay, so as it came out in nineteen uh, ninety nine, there's a millennium edition, but that's not really important. The important part is that there is a complete edition that includes the two expansion packs, official expansion packs. Uh, there's some one of those expansion packs one. ain't great, is it? Like I've heard that one of them ain't good. Uh, so Shadow of Death is pretty good because it's very story heavy and it. It's very much focused on character, so and I would say map-wise, it's also pretty good, especially because it focuses on a couple of different factions, but really only on three, so it gives you a really good experience with these specific ones. The other one is more a couple of independent campaigns. Those ones are actually the one that advance the story, but at the same time, they also introduce new creatures and whatnot. They do introduce a new faction called the Conflux. That's like an elemental faction. They have elementals and like fairies and phoenixes. That one is the most powerful one by far, so it's completely imbalanced. It has is it tournament banned. Um, it, I'm not quite sure whether it's tournament banned, but uh, it is occasionally there are no conflux rules, and it also depends on the map because some maps have fixed factions, so because cities are fixed, so you won't be able to play conflux anyway. It's main yeah, problem. The thing about this game is because it is um it, in this genre, they're all got the maps which are kind of pre-canned in a lot of ways but more so than normal because all the layout for all of the creatures and stuff has to remain kind of consistent otherwise it gets weird yeah Yeah. i think you can randomize it up to a certain degree you can place random artifacts in the in the editor here but you can only do so much yeah going back to the versions a little bit uh, just briefly so there's a hd version and it's generally not recommended to get that one. It does improve the graphics a little bit, but not really to a significant degree. And it does miss those two expansions because the code was lost. <laughs> the new world computing was not that great at uh, keeping their code. Uh, partially, new world computing, old world storage. Yeah. I would say partially maybe because the company went under and was bought. So it could be that <laughs> whoever, whoever lost their job in that transition just didn't bother because it wasn't their job anymore. So, but this, this has to be but this thought- just about. Yeah. So, uh, this has to just about be the last game with their name on it, isn't it? Um, that's possible. I know they they have this fairly iconic intro with the with the globe and everything. The sword and the. Mm, yeah, I'm not quite sure whether the later Might and Magic games actually. Yeah, oh, no, those whether those I still have the they- name attached to it. They they might now that I think about it. They might have kept that all the way to yeah. nine. At the very I know that there's a, a spin off series called of the spin off series called Heroes Chronicles that bridges Heroes three and Heroes four. Yeah, it gets this series is nuts. <laughs> yeah, that one's uh, pretty crazy. But going again back to the HD version mm-hmm. last time, I promise. Yeah. Is that <laughs> so? They lost the code, so the expansions are unincluded. And other than that, there's a HD mod that not only. Is of very high quality. It also includes a couple of quality of life features, and that's widely used by the community. So it's a very good quality, very stable, and that's generally what's considered to be the gold standard for playing this game here in high definition. Now, my impression, I can't remember, one of the HD things just includes only one of the expansions? Is that uh, right? Not really. So you can play all of the expansions. So the, the official HD version of this game includes only... The base game restoration of Erathia. The HD mod supports all of them. I think officially it only supports the the base game as well. But I think they'd say that because if someone runs into technical problems, then mm. they probably don't want people to like scream at the modders who do this in their free time, um, saying, "Oh, why doesn't this work?" So they just say, "Told you so." Only the base game. That would be my assumption. I don't know, <laughs> but I think uh, to once if you do fan work like this. I think it's generally fair to include disclaimers like that. Most also, most of them also have disclaimers like if this um, that detonates your computer, then it's your fault, which is understandable because this is stuff that people do in their free time, and it's it's a mod, it's not commercial, so uh, you, you can only expect so much from the product and from the people who make it. Not out any money. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I do think uh, I do have to mention, as you said before, the uh, the HD mod. Uh, it doesn't do much of a graphics thing. It pulls the graphics back so you can see more, which uh, is is a good thing, but also potentially not if you uh, 
you know, uh, don't quite like the incredibly zoomed out look. Which could be that is true. So on my screen, so I've got a 1440p, 1440p screen that was difficult. And I would not advise to play the game in a resolution like that or let alone 4K <laughs> because everything will be really small. So going maybe half of that or maybe 1080p is fine. And that gives you a good, a good balance between seeing enough but also still theoretically being able to click on the many, many little things that yeah, there's has. quite a few. I did find myself misclicking a little bit, especially getting into some of the uh, tiles where it's like, no, 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 no. The door is next to the door. Click next to the door. Otherwise, you're yeah, yeah, it's not always obvious. Yeah, <laughs> a character just futilely runs beside the building. I'm like, no, go in the building. Yeah, you, and there's one. You do get used to it. Eventually. Can you, yeah. um, cause there's some things, uh, you can't turn on, uh, see tiles, can you? Uh, it's not in. You can or see the grid. Yeah. You can do, you can do it in battle. You can, the yeah. combat, the battle map yeah. allows you to do that. I don't think the main map does. Actually, does it? Ooh. I've never found a way because I really would like a grid in this. Uh, if the so, map. it might be a, a mod feature, but I don't think the, the, the official version of the game does that. Yeah, so it can be like, especially since you do have, um, it's, it's a turn based game, so you do have a limited amount of movement. Uh, and, uh, it does one thing that I've never really been a fan of. Um, it remembers where you want to go between steps, but I believe you do have to manually say, keep stepping, keep stepping, keep yep. stepping. Uh, um, yes, there's a button for that, but you still have yeah, to hit the is. button. Yeah, yeah, you gotta hit the button. Yeah, cause I, I actually, I just came into this problem. I kind of played the game once more just to make sure it was all in my head again this like a couple hours ago and um i was kind of curious because i usually i just change my mind in between every turn so i usually don't have it but i wanted to have like this the system where this guy goes back and forth yeah. between the two castles turning all his elves into skeletons uh, boy. and um Ooh, plate, plate <laughs> skeleton factory <laughs> I, I wanted to see how broken the skeleton take, factory we, we, was. We, we, we take the elves and we, and we turn them into skeletons, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. <laughs> Although, you know what makes me really mad? Centaurs don't produce two skeletons. Why would oh. they produce two skeletons? <laughs> a human skeleton and a horse skeleton. Yeah. So the Where's the heads? <laughs> <laughs> I, I've probably got a couple of spare heads. Yeah, like, like yeah. spare heads. Actually, I'm a necromancer. Hey, 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 actually, I can tell you where. So, if you threw a hydra into the skeleton converter, I think it gives you <laughs> it gives you one skeleton dragon. Mm. Also, okay. one thing you know what bothers me about skeleton dragon. So, this, so uh, one thing we haven't mentioned yet is that you can upgrade all creatures. Mm -hmm. If you upgrade oh, them, yeah. they become stronger, and so that's a, a tactical element because they might get new abilities. For example, the upgraded crossbow archers attack twice. And it also adds a strategic element because you have to decide when do you want to upgrade because you cannot mix upgraded and non-upgraded stacks. Yes. And you also have to see, oh, do I want to upgrade these now or would I rather recruit more unupgraded ones? So stuff like that. And the upgrade of the skeleton dragon is the ghost dragon. But the ghost dragon isn't the, isn't the, the ghost of uh, a dragon. It's the ghost of the skeleton of a dragon. Because they usually use a modified model. So what's up with that? So who made the, the poor skeleton dragon and then killed it again, then resurrected it as a ghost? <laughs> skeleton, ghost, dragon, skeleton dragons, zombie skeleton, ghost dragon. Yeah. But no, I literally had a skeleton factory where I was recruiting elves and centaurs and turning them into skeletons. It was fantastic. But no, I made the mistake of skipping a turn because I thought, oh, they'll just auto move. Along no, the they path, no. they they do not. It warns you, and that's something that I do like. The game is full of tool yeah. tips. There's so many. If you're trying to do something stupid, the game will probably be like, "Hold on, do you really <laughs> want to do that? That's a really dumb move." Uh, like, do you, they do really want to attack that horde of titans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got eighty three thousand skeletons. Let's go. Um, it, it'll do things like if you're probably going to lose a, a fight, you know, if you if you suck like me, the game will be like. Your hero uh, thinks that the odds are overwhelming. Would you like to retreat? <laughs> oh, it does do the uh, the good thing, though. And it goes, you kick this thing's ass without even needing to fight. You want to just skip this battle? It's That's most useful, I think, in campaign, because you can max out your character's level for that stage. So yep. you don't need the experience. So you can be like, no, nope, just let him leave. Um, which is handy. Not as handy, I think, in multiplayer because you want as much experience as possible if you can get it. Because that's true. You you got to climb those climb those ranks. 
Um, yeah, I didn't do it. Th- I was, I kept meaning to see if you would still get the skeletons for it, but then I kept forgetting which one was the fight. Which um, one? Like you, I, I didn't read the dialogue box yeah. so closely. I'm like, yeah, I'll fight these guys. Yeah, you you then- still have to fight. Otherwise, I think the stack just runs away, which just means it, it right. disappears. But yeah, yeah. It, it's just. But there's some other stuff like you get permanent stat upgrades from the levels, I believe. Um, yes, which I do. think you could just. You can mine that, I think, if you are a jackass, um, since you can keep your heroes between stages in the story. Mm, in some campaigns, yes. Uh, in some campaigns, your heroes become really, really popular, especially because you can learn spells like Summon Elemental, which usually isn't that powerful because you need to level it up. But if you just start a fresh scenario and you only have a couple of troops, but you can summon 128 like lava elementals, that's pretty good. It's, the game is, you know, it's it's definitely one for people that uh, enjoy finding if the game can handle the strategy they are coming up with. Um, the answer is always no. <laughs> Generally, no, no, not against the AI. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, Clay mentioned the skeletons. The skeletons are a lot of fun because there's a so there's one faction that's the it's a necromancer faction, and they have the necromancy ability, which resurrects a certain amount of the troops that you just murdered as skeletons, which can mean that you might lose troops in battle, but you make a, a net positive in troops. That's was definitely ske- something that threw me out in this game. Um, I'm so used to other games in this genre being like, your units have health or they have a, you know, they have like a thing. Whereas in this game, I guess we should very clearly clarify, uh, you lose troops, that's it. Like, you exchange troops, you have to go back to uh, either a recruitment place or to, uh, you know, like the castles and stuff to add more troops it's actually a really interesting sort of um supply line sort of game in in some ways you've it takes each turn represents days and weeks and you only get so many things per week you can only add something to your castle once per day uh and you burn through troops as you move through the stage there is actually kind of soft attrition going on so you end up Having like a, a campaign feels kind of like a campaign. Like you can push through an area and be like, "Well, I've I've lost like a hundred units. It didn't matter if I started with you know that many units. I've burnt through them. I'm gonna have to retreat. You actually have to think about whether you push forward or retreat. And that's I think is interesting. Unless if you're playing vampire lords, <laughs> then those just come back. Yep, they should. Necromancy do. is uh, banned apparently in most competitive scenes. I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> There's a good reason for it, I discovered. <laughs> They're fucking ridiculous. I think it's kind of interesting, because obviously the necromancy and vampire stuff is usually generally quite overpowered in, I guess, traditional D&D and stuff. It's always kind of sitting in the, like, this is the, the really top-tier villain enemy stuff, because they're like, yeah. we don't die, and then we just keep, you know, snowballing. So it's like, okay, that sounds pretty broken, and, and it, it is. But it's... The game's got such a long amount of stuff to do in it, too, right? This game goes forever, even without the expansion packs. And once you include those, it's, you know, you got so many levels and, yeah, you can play the single map or whatever as whatever yeah. set you want. It's quite considerable. In the vanilla game, too, there's like 80 squintillion single scenarios. It's ridiculous. Yeah, there's a lot of community-made content as well. So if, you, if you're done with the game <laughs> at one point... <laughs> which you might be like five years after starting to play it. You can do that yes. as well. So there's, there's a lot to do. And because the battles, if you have a difficult battle that can take you like five to 10 minutes to complete. So, and that's just one battle. That's not the map. And you might find, yeah, you're a saying of the those. battle where you're like, yeah. this is an important battle. I'm not going to turn on auto. Exactly. And yeah. Um, I'm so going to just throw this, uh, it, you got anything left to say about this one specifically? Cause we're going to have to put it somewhere on the list pretty soon. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't say specifically. It's it's fairly imbalanced, but I think it does profit from its single player content. It's popular in multiplayer as well, but I think considering that it's turn based and the white camp can be quite long, this shines in single player the most, in my opinion. It also doesn't yeah. have like a play by email, right? Specifically because it has the combat, which is you know you have to actually resolve that between players. You that is true. Yeah. So it, it doesn't have, it'd be really handy if it had just always auto, because then you yeah. could uh, play by, you know, actually exchanging the, the games. That might be handy. Or, or you'd have to play by email between every combat round. But then you probably need decades to finish any game. Yeah. So that just does not sound like no. a good way. No, uh, quick not, question. Not a uh, what are your favorite and least favorite factions, depending on what you like saw in the game? 
Oh, that's a good one. I'm, I really, really like necromancy because I'm a, I'm a trading card player at heart. So dumb engines that let me keep getting snowballing, snowballing. That just tickles me in my trading card part of my brain. So that was, that was great. I mean, this game also does uh, that, uh, where you get, um, constantly throws you what i believe uh ea now calls surprise boxes um <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, le- Topical. it re- leverages that kind of thing because as we mentioned you click on a landscape and like a piece of thing and it's like oh a thing happened and you're like oh goody a thing happened um <laughs> you know like it yeah, there aren't a lot of dead turns in this game yeah it, it constantly like oh what's that artifact i'm gonna click it oh i got an artifact like it, it does that like every damn Every damn turn, it's just got stuff going on. You got, because we mentioned it, and it, that, that's why it's kind of, it's got this, like, the, the, that sort of thing. Like, it's always constantly exciting, unlike some grand strategy games where you're very much like, on this turn, I moved these units. Next turn. Next turn. Next yeah. turn. In, in Heroes 3, you, you just visit a leprechaun to get extra lucky during the next fight. And stuff that's like so that. cheating too like those extra luck <laughs> just lets you smash your way through things oh yeah I, um, I really like luck there's an ability for that as well and if you have, if you have maxed out luck and probably some luck artifacts as well you just you get it fairly often and it's very satisfying to see oh this deck attacks again because they just actually know yeah, they deal extra damage it's mor- there's, morale there's luck and morale yeah and they like it's the gold like a metal explodes on top of the character. They're like, I'm going to fight again. And then they get double damage as well. And you're like, yes, yes, yes. But if the enemy have morale, you're like, oh no, oh no, I wasn't expecting that to happen. That's not good. Um, also, they can have low morale, which is nice. And they're like, oh, I'm too, uh, I'm not attacking this round. Can't be bothered. Ugh. Especially if you mix <laughs> different creatures. If you have an, a homogenous army, then you get a bonus. And if you if you oh. mix creatures, especially if they're not from the same alignment, there's the game a game is racist as crap. Well, it's like alignmentists. Yeah, That's, yeah. It's, mm-hmm. uh, no, no, nobody nobody likes battle. undead. If you have undead in your army, then yeah, you don't that want to hang out with problem. the undead. No. I mean, <laughs> even if they're just skeletons who are creepy, and they're like, so fun fact. So funny story. Yeah. Oh, okay, so there's some. Come in a story. Yeah. So we, we, there's a neutral unit. A there's a neutral one. unit called the Mummy. Uh, they introduced reintroduced that one from Heroes Two. That's also undead, but because it's neutral, even the Mummy gets like poor morale from hanging <laughs> out with other undead, which just that bugs me even more as a skeleton dragon thing. Anyway, Clay. Well, I mean, the mummies might be like uh, you know only like reasonably well off uh, people were interned properly as a mummy, so maybe it's just like, look at these low tier undead. I'm better than them. <laughs> no, I, I I'm happy to hear it because uh, right before I quit to come do this, I uh, I I was in the middle of my skeleton elf train, and um, my elves and my dwarves they got really low morale for some stupid reason they stopped fighting really the people so that like, formed part of the skeleton factory <laughs> turned into skeletons were unimpressed by your skeleton factory yeah so i got ambushed or whatever in the middle so all my skeletons are fighting fine but my dwarves and my elves kept getting low morale they won't fight this turn so there's a spell in the game that you get as a necromancer called death ripple which does damage to everything that's not an undead and i'd been avoiding it because i didn't want to waste all that money but that was like a really even match battle and they stopped fighting for me so i kept death rippling and their morale i think kept getting worse because <laughs> i kept exploding everything on the board and they're like he's still not gonna fight this turn i'm like well then guess what's happening death ripple <laughs> okay well uh, that's uh that's so this is the best game ever made i think after that story <laughs> awful awful like thing you know you're the villain in the game you know that right like you you're the baddies yes. here <laughs> you won't fight for me then i'll kill you all yeah the, 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 <laughs> yeah, the, the best fodder for the skeleton factory are the peasants because the peasants have um a stat of one in everything except for movement which is three and they, they just melt like butter you can have a yeah. like a, a stack of a thousand peasants and they get like another creature just looks at them once and then half of them are dead it's, it's amazing yeah it's great until you have a really good hero and then they hit like a Hit like a truck. That's true. And now I've got to begin the ranking factory. Sweet Jesus. (laughs) All righty. Yeah, we have to rank Uh, So I've been staring right here uh, at 140, 141. I'm just saying that's where we put Final Fantasy Tactics and Age of Wonders Shadow Magic. Um, Super comparable games. Yeah. What are we looking at? Considering this game's uh, enduring popularity, even within its own franchise, 
I would say this should be ranked a lot higher. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. It's it's an enduring game. Like it's something I heard about like not even before I played like Might and Magic. It was something like strategy players are always like, Yeah, play Heroes of Might and Magic if you like strategy games. I'm like, well, or Heroes of Might and Magic 3. I'm like, well, I'm going to have to look into this. Also, I will mention, uh, it's pretty freaking blatantly obvious, uh, Blizzard just straight up, like, nicked pretty much half this game for Warcraft 3. Like, just, they just took it. Um, yeah. The whole, like, heroes leveling up thing, uh, the way that you sort of have that sort of built in, the creeping through the map, that's all kind of, uh, huh. it's very, like, has, you know, a history. There's some overlap. I wonder how much influence this game has had on other non-strategy games. Because to once the style is somewhat unique. There aren't really that many direct clones of this game. You'd think there would yeah, be that's more. Yeah. Interesting there are some it. games that do that as well, especially with the creature stacking. But to be honest, for the most part, the strategy games tend to stick with single creatures. Yeah, I, I found this one, I find this a really, like, interesting game for it's kind of just simplified enough that it's possible to get into and the resolution of things doesn't actually usually take forever even though we've said that it's quite long it is but it doesn't feel that long you'll start playing it and the pace is brisk enough that it'll be 3 a.m and you'll be like oh crap i was supposed to finish this a long time ago oh no (laughs) yeah no it's like i said there are very few dead turns in the game it's so good can we is it ridiculous if we say top 100? No, I would I say it's th- this can this definitely thing. go into the top 100. <laughs> top 50? Um, Ooh, see, let's just this see. This is where we're going to think about it. Um, obviously, yeah, right now at 50, we have Drilldozer, which I basically never oh. mention. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. nobody knows anything about Drilldozer except it's an exceptional Game Boy Advance game. Uh, that is true. If you hadn't mentioned it right now, I would have forgotten that it does indeed <laughs> sit in that place. Yeah. Which is not judgment of Drilldozer. It's just... No. Uh, um. I do think, I do really appreciate this one. Um, I think its influence of the Heroes of Might and Magic series is probably a deeper uh, cut than we probably would expect because this is, might be the premier 4X fantasy game. This is the best of the franchise, maybe. And the franchise had quite heavy influence, but not in a real direct way. As you said, there aren't that many clones but uh, uh, like a lot of the way that the lighter mechanics yeah. work, the the way it doesn't waste turns, the way you uh, sort of handle the um, interface, the title screen is absolute nonsense. God damn, this is the worst main menu I've ever seen, ever that isn't a flash game. Just uh, unbelievable. Oh, you should uh, you should play the uh, 3DO Might and Magics I at least to the should. title screen because they all kind of share that terrible, terrible title uh, screen. It's, it's such a 3DO thing. I, <laughs> I totally buy that they did that. Um, yeah, actually. <laughs> Okay, well, we got to sort of look around. Um, I'm just sort of... Well, we have Civilization at 56. Yeah. Yes, we do. <laughs> That's maybe the challenge. Okay. That's maybe the one that has to So here's my, my case for putting this above Civilization. Mm-hmm. So Civilization also has enduring popularity, but I would say Civilization was, compared to the Hero series, a little bit less original. I think Civilization is a little bit of an ambassador for the 4X genre. But what was new about it was mostly the package. I didn't think I don't think Civilization brought all that much to the table. It just hadn't been brought to the table in, in the way that Civilization did it. Yeah, um, yeah, because Heroes of Might and Magic, we talked about how it doesn't inspire a lot of games. And I think if you take too much out of Heroes of Might and Magic without thinking about it, you're just going to break things and it doesn't work. Yeah. Like Heroes of Might and Magic is a perfect storm in its mechanics and in a lot of ways. My other so case would, feel like that. My other case would be that a lot of the Heroes games, except maybe Ma- 1, Heroes 1 is pretty much Heroes 2, but but worse. It's not really a bad game. It's just the first installment, so it's kind of rough. But the other games can kind of stand on their own. 2 is pl- still very playable, so are uh, 4 is slightly controversial because the middle of changes. 5 is popular. Whereas the the Civilization games mostly build it upon one another. And uh, I'm pretty sure people have franchise favorites, but for the most part, there's no reason to play Civilization today. You can just play one of the later games. And yeah. I would say with, with the Heroes uh, series, it's not quite the case. The games are a little bit distinct enough that you can still return to those, which is also the reason why Heroes 3 is still the most popular one, even though it's 20 years old. It's an enduring yeah. classic. That's true. So... Uh, I, my case would be to put this above Wario Land 4. 
That I'd would, be okay with that. That would put it below Minesweeper at number 45, above Warrior. And Man. I think... Mm-hmm. I don't let it go above Minesweeper. No, because Minesweeper, it, well, I guess sort of a stretch again. Minesweeper is probably more popular just because it comes with Windows, or used to. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. I sort of think... I, I, mm. Yeah. I was going to say, I think Clay's sweating a little bit, because if it goes above 40, it goes above Valkyrie Profile. I don't think Ooh. we'll let that happen. Ooh, that's a tough one. I really like this game. This game is some supreme fun. Like, it's amazing. But no, I think in reality, I don't let it really go above Minesweeper, because Minesweeper is also kind of hits the same spot to your brain, and it's maybe a little better built. They're both clickers in a weird way. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I guess with this one, I'm trying to rack my brain, specifically... Uh, to think of a 4X game that does do you want to what this is doing I, I, better I than probably this. probably wouldn't, wouldn't call it 4X because, I mean, I you would... can call a lot of strategy games 4X, but I think people expect more like a civilization game from that where you expand on the map, whereas in Heroes, like the cities are fixed and the focus is very much on the combat. I think you could make the case for it being 4X, but I don't think that's what most people would use for it. I... I don't know, like, I, I do think, like, if you're gonna, if you're gonna split hairs, maybe, but just the way that the, the ebb and flow of the game, including, uh, like, I don't think you have much diplomacy, I think is the main thing, uh-huh. I guess, would Diplomacy is, well, there's a, lot of well there's, there's a skill called diplomacy, that's the, I know there's a skill called that, diplomacy. That one's completely broken. That's, that's more broken than necromancy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think either we keep it with my, like I said, I'm going to put it, my case for keeping it below Minesweeper is Minesweeper hits the same sort of spots. And it's essentially not as busted as this game, but if it goes above Minesweeper, then I'm going to take this all the way as far as I can yeah. get also, so. <laughs> also, side note, as much time as uh, Heroes 3 is able to suck up, Bejeweled has probably like cost humanity more man hours that could have advanced our yeah. society than Heroes 3. Think of the Bitcoin we could have generated with all of that CP. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 1999 CPU. I yeah. Think so. <laughs> Heroes of Might 3 <laughs> Blockchain Edition. <laughs> Look, I'm going to put it uh, above Warrior Land 4 and below Minesweeper. Yep. And the reason I'm doing it that. is I can think of literally no better introduction to the expanded genre of turn based strategy than this game. I cannot do it. Um, yeah. Because it is. Firstly, there's some stuff that's so clear, you know, it's got a nice fantasy thing, it looks okay, <laughs> but it's it's got so many tool tips, the game works really well. You don't have to know what you're doing, and the game will basically push you in the right direction, and that's so generous, and because it doesn't have all of that extra building and diplomacy that it's carved out, or it has intentionally not decided to go down, you can actually kind of manage it without it, um, you know, becoming like, oh, you should have built this thing and that tech tree three hours ago, which happens in just about every actual Forex game. It's like, why am I, why did I lose? And you have to like go with a fine tooth comb across your entire playthrough. Like, oh, turn seven, I should have done that. Like, it doesn't, doesn't feel quite like that. And I, I, I genuinely think this one for its a time and to this day is still like a really great, example i cannot think of one that like if i wanted to play this one i wouldn't load up something else like there's nothing i can think of other than games in this exact genre that like in this exact franchise rather that hit exactly these notes even though i like games like disciple and uh age of wonders uh they're not the same thing and they're not quite as light as this one which is weird um it just hits every note that's correct and if you haven't played it you Definitely should, because it's pretty available and cheap on GOG, I think. And yeah. maybe other services. I don't know. Don't care. You should do it. Tax? Yep. There it goes. Below Minesweeper, above World Land 4, it's a new number 45. So, I wanted to say one last thing, if I could. I normally don't like broken games. Like, I've derided a lot of games for being busted and not working. This game is so much fun, it overrides all that. It's, like Cal said, it's so easy to get into, so easy to get out of, in, out. I don't think it's easy to get out of. You're you're trapped. Watch (laughs) out. Don't play this game. (laughs) Okay, fair. It's really easy to get in and play and get a lot of enjoyment out of, and even for all of its mess, it is one of the most fun strategy games in the whole wide world. And that's definitely why it goes this high. Play it. That's all for this episode. 
Special thanks goes out to our lovely co-hosts and compatriots, our booking agent Jeff Rude, our theme song MC Norm, check him out at Normally Retro on Twitter, and our technical assistant, video editor, and scriptwriter Ed Burns. You can support this podcast by making a small monthly donation at patreon.com slash HG101. I know I did. By subscribing to the HG101 YouTube channel, and by following at G X and at HG underscore 101 on Twitter. You can also hang out with us at our Discord uh, channel. It's at bit.ly slash HD Discord. But most Importantly, help us spread the love of games by getting on iTunes, subscribing to HG101, and giving us a five-star review. Do it, because you like us, and you want us to succeed. Until next time, keep keeping it real. <laughs>